in these deep, dark waters have been made some of the most sensational discoveries from the prehistoric world. I think that this site is one of the most spectacular windows into the past that one could ever have. What we have is, in this one hole standing right here, a fossil history of both the flora and fauna of the Pleistocene going back at least 20,000 years. Today, divers and archaeologists working underwater here at Warm Mineral Springs, Florida, are changing our understanding of prehistoric man. While on the other side of the globe, in the icy lakes of Switzerland, archaeologists are excavating a Bronze Age village. And in Scotland, scientists are piecing together the lives of Iron Age dwellers. Well, if you sat here 2,600 years ago, you would have seen the lights of four other planets. And you would have known that the people were living there, doing what you're doing here. And presumably, they were friends, they were neighbors, they knew what was going on. They were all part of the same community. Join the adventure that is changing our whole understanding of prehistoric man. Next, on Discoveries Underwater. Discoveries Underwater is made possible in part by a grant from the DuPont Company. DuPont, better things for better living. And by this and other public television stations. Divers and archaeologists working underwater today are changing our whole understanding of prehistoric man. Information is now being discovered of a world far more sophisticated and organized than had previously been imagined. The search for human settlements that existed thousands of years ago is underway on a global scale. We have chosen just three parts of the world to show the variety and extent of the work going on. North America, Switzerland, and here, the central highlands of Scotland. In the shallows of Loch Tay, there were once settlements and communities that flourished some two and a half thousand years ago. In Scotland alone, there are over 350 of these man-made islands, or crannogs, some just visible beneath the surface. Here, at Oak Bank Cranog, 50 yards from the shore and beneath a large pile of stones, is a late Bronze Age house. A team of divers are now working their way into the heart of the living area. The dwelling probably looked like this and was home for an extended family of up to 14 people. Carbon dating, taken from a central supporting pile, gave a date of 595 BC. Good morning. The archeologist yeah. leading the team is Dr. Nicholas Dixon from St. Andrews Hello. University. We want to take advantage of these conditions up on area G because yesterday trying it, uh, it was almost impossible to move around with the waves. 
Living in old trailers and tents, the group consists of unpaid volunteers from a variety of backgrounds and countries. They supply all their own equipment and work for up to eight hours a day underwater. Are you happy? Well, these are the best conditions that we've had in the loft, I think, so far, so let's make the best use of them. It's 4th of July, that's why. <laughs> Quite obviously, you didn't have one standard plan like this. It's not a modern housing um, scheme. The so chance must not be missed to spread ways. the word to a visiting the group right. of the importance and potential of the site. As, as I can see, in fact, the majority didn't have causeways, although everybody seems to think that they did. Um, they certainly had freestanding piles. The problems confronting Nicholas Dixon are not just confined to public relations and organizing the team, however. down onto the loft bed. It became a mound that the people lived on rather than a pile dwelling. This walkway that you see here is the first time we've ever had a walkway out to the site and it's absolutely fantastic. It means we can get right to the site. The site is just on the other edge of the platform that you see there and it's within the ring of boys. Before the 1985 season we had carried out three years of excavation on the site and we had come up with this plan. What we're looking at, though, is the entranceway to the house. So it's the entranceway to a late Bronze Age house or early Iron Age house. Uh, you come in through the doorway, or you come into the entranceway, and then you can come through this door or this door, we're not sure which was, would be used most, into the centre of the house. Uh, the door faces to the northeast, so the prevailing wind is from the southwest, so it means that it's also a sheltered entrance. These are the horizontal timbers that were actually laid down that the people put their brackens and ferns and such like on, and they lived on this floor. And there was a screen across here to protect the inside of the house from the elements. For five years, the work has been restricted to a few weeks in the summer. Money is the biggest handicap. A prehistoric land site attracts little enough attention, but when the site is hidden underwater, gathering funds becomes a real problem. The budget for this excavation is around $900 a year. The first task for the divers is to remove the covering of stones. With a rubber boat and an old bed frame, they have developed a kind of ingenious aquatic dump truck. Over the last 2,000 years, as the water level rose, the dwelling gradually collapsed into the lock. The stones were added later and may have supported a new house, but that has long been washed away, leaving the earlier Bronze Age house trapped underneath. Once the stones have been removed, the precious organic layers are revealed, preserved by the peaty waters of the lock. It's that preservation of even the most fragile material that makes the excavation of prehistoric sites underwater unique. Every pile, floor timber, and feature is drawn on transparent sheets to be recorded layer by layer. That way, in time, a true picture of the construction of the house can be worked out. Was it a defended farmstead? Was it home for the animals as well as the people? The information coming from archaeological sites being excavated underwater, which has only been going on for 25 years or so anyway, is unique. It's crucial. It is changing the picture of archaeology everywhere it's being practiced. Sites underwater are particularly important for prehistorians because we have no written records at these times. How we find out about the people is by looking at the remains either in the earth or under the water or wherever. We have no history, we have no written books. So these sites are particularly important to prehistory.
underwater, the wood looks just as it did when it was cut down. The bark is still intact, and the color is fresh and bright. But all that changes when it is exposed to air. Unless the wood is kept wet, it will quickly crack and fall apart. Uh, what should you do? Put, put them up underneath the big there is another more instant transformation. Break a piece in two, and in 40 seconds, the orange heart will turn gray and then black. come in all shapes and sizes. There are 18 in Loch Tay, many within sight of each other. Some were used right up to the 17th century and still show the ruins of their last inhabitants. One thing they all have in common, every stone and rock that make up these islands was put there by man. In the early 1900s, the Reverend Frederick Odo Blundell donned a brass hooded diving suit and began some limited investigations of the Cranogs. It was one of the earliest attempts at underwater archeology. span but until the invention of the modern aqualung, no really serious work had been done. Excavation of fine organic material is a delicate, painstaking process. But after special study, it's possible to determine the climate, the varieties of vegetation, and even the diet of the people who lived here so many years ago. Fortunately, underwater, objects are magnified by one third, which makes the job of collecting two and a half thousand year old sheep droppings and seeds a relatively easy task, even with a spoon. There is one overriding problem that threatens the site and its delicate fabric. The prevailing southwesterly winds can kick up a choppy sea. If the water starts to move, loose objects can be broken and washed away. If it rains, hails, or snows, that's fine. The only thing we can't really take is water movement like this. They're not very big waves, but they're very choppy waves. And we're only working a meter, a meter and a half from the surface. So people are actually being swept backwards and forwards across the organic material that we want to find and we want to very delicately excavate. This has been the worst year that we've ever had. We deliberately came this time of the year in the summer to get the best of the weather. And we've never had weather so bad. Uh, these conditions are appalling. Nevertheless, even with that, we're still turned up I think some very good work. Everybody's working in foul conditions, but we're coming up with it. The decision to pull the divers out of the water is only moments away when there is a major and unexpected discovery. A race now begins to get what proves to be a wooden spoon out of the rough water before it is damaged by the action of the waves. was very, very rough at that time, and I brought it up in a large blue plastic container. 
But the danger point is just as you bring it to the surface, because there are waves, water can wash into the container and throw the, the spoon around and break it against the side of the container. So it has to be well judged just to bring it out of the water at the right time, and willing hands have to be there to pick the thing up. The morale of the team is boosted every time we find something which is exciting. We've found wooden dishes, we've found a, a complete canoe paddle, and a wooden spoon is a very, very nice find. It brings home to you that you are actually working with the remains of objects used by people 2,600 years ago, and that in fact that spoon was last seen, was last used by people in the late Bronze Age at this very, very ancient time. As far as finds and their importance on the site, archaeology is not about finds. They're very important because they tell us about the people. But the whole site is what's important, the structure of the site and how people would have lived in it and what they would have used. So finds are important to show us what people would have used and how they would have used them, but they are not the be-all and end-all. The excavation of one of the main supporting piles with all of its axe marks intact shows the ability of these early people to shape and build a sophisticated dwelling. We now know the climate was not so very different from today. There were cherry trees, firs and alder. People kept cattle and sheep, grew cereal crops, ate the cherries and cooked the meat, and even stirred the soup with that large wooden spoon. on this as well. If you, could, if you conserve that, will you be able to keep the bark on the sapwood or would it just come off? We're going to have a lot of problems with the sapwood splitting off from the heartwood already. Uh -huh. Further information about the site is gleaned from the analysis and conservation of the finds. But it is an expensive business, so they have to be selective. This would be freeze-dry again to retain all this marking, these beautiful markings, mm. the actual uh, tool markings. Ah, this is the plough. Well, whether it's a plough or not, we're not quite sure. What would you, how would you conserve it? Again, well, much the same freeze drying, but you're going to have mm. to take a lot longer freeze drying time and watch the object drying. At this end, which I think is obviously the part that would actually be turning over the soil, so to speak, there's a little bit of natural erosion underneath. So, I mean, how long would you think it would take to conserve something like that? something of this size again about four or five months i don't really see how you could confidently say things about the early iron age or the late bronze age in scotland without taking cognizance of sites like these without accepting the fact that the excavation of a site which is turning up so much organic material and with the chance of 350 other sites which will turn up the same sort of material all the theories we have all the ideas we have are liable to be turned head over heels um, in the next Cranach excavation. So I don't really see how they can't be looked at as one of the most important types of site being excavated in this country today. It is now thought that people did not live out in the lock from a sense of fear or retreat, but because it was more convenient. They moved around by boat and plowed the flat land along the shore. No weapons have yet been found, no burials, just the remains of what seems to have been a peaceful, hard-working agricultural family. The summer season has lasted for 10 short weeks. There's not enough money or resources to continue longer, but it's pioneering research that will help rewrite the history books for succeeding generations. When people come and ask, you know, why did people live here? 2,500, 2,600 years ago, I say, look around you. It's a fabulous place to live. Well, if you sat here 2,600 years ago, probably around a fire very like this, because the wood's the same, it comes from around here, 
and these are all natural woodlands. And you looked up here, you would have seen the lights of four other Cranogs. And you would have known that the people were living there, doing what you're doing here. And presumably, they were friends, they were neighbors, they knew what was going on. They were all part of the same community. So they'd be transmitting things up and down the rivers, over the hills, around the locks, by canoe, by water, and they'd be using water a lot. So they would certainly have had communications. An earlier society that definitely had far-reaching communications and even trade existed around 5,000 years ago. Away from Scotland, in the heart of Europe, in the Swiss lakes, there remains today one of the largest concentrations of Bronze Age villages yet discovered. Chief archaeologist for the canton of Zurich and diver is Dr. Ulrich Ruoff. Just here in the water, are thousands and thousands of pilings from prehistoric times, from villages built between 4,000 before Christ to about 1,000 for Christ. One layer above another with many and many finds. During the very cold winter of 1853 to 54, there was a marked lowering of the water level in the lake. Exposed on the shores were forests and stumps, as well as pottery and bronze. It aroused an international interest. These contemporary drawings show some of the world's earliest underwater excavations. The villages spread all around the lake, supporting a large industrious population. At some time, the people left and the settlements were lost. For centuries, they remained hidden and undisturbed. Today, a full team of divers, led by Dr. Ruoff, one of the world's most respected underwater archaeologists, works all year round on sites threatened by developments or shoreline erosion. Under the ice, lines of pilings mark the foundations of a large village as yet untouched. Since we dive, I think we have collected more items than have been collected over the last hundred years. When things were taken out with uh, dredging machines, people couldn't see them in the mud. So they collected only the pottery and, the, and only the nice pieces, not everything as we do today. They didn't think that everything speaks something about the life in the past. The finds, like this votive offering and these ornamental cloak pins, are the most spectacular and complete record of the Bronze Age. They give a vivid insight into a sophisticated society specialized in pottery and bronze, with carpenters and tool makers who made these complete wooden axes. Dr. Ruoff and his team have collected so much pottery, and some pieces are enormous and found complete, that they can fill many warehouses and museums. Unlike Nicholas Dixon in Scotland, the technical and financial backup made available in Switzerland enables a team of technicians to work full time, cataloging, recording, and reconstructing every artifact and scrap of information. It's a most efficient archaeological operation and has earned Dr. Ulrich Ruoff worldwide respect. Zurich would seem a strange place to find such underwater expertise, but the traditions of land archaeology go back a long way in Switzerland. In 
62, there were some divers coming to my office and told me that they had found interesting things on the bottom of the lake and people told them that they should bring it to me and that they should have my permission and I thought, oh, uh, I didn't like to hear it because uh, I said, what will these divers do? They can't really, they aren't archaeologists. But then I, after a little while, I said to me, it's better to work with them than against them. Over the last 25 years, the barriers and prejudices against underwater archaeology have been increasingly broken down. Under Dr. Ruoff's guidance, careful, methodical, and scientific work has produced information and data of such quality that previous critics have been silenced. The work never stops. With increased pollution in the lakes, the reed banks retreat and the water eats away at the silt. In this way, new sites are found all the time. Here at Griefen Sea, a small lake eight miles from Zurich, a Bronze Age village of at least 16 houses has been uncovered. But with the lake frozen solid, the divers can't get to the site. This ice is too thin to walk across and too thick for a boat. But as soon as there's a break, they'll be in. As the divers cut into the sediments, an artificial current is set up by forcing water through small holes in a pipe. It helps to draw the disturbed silt away from the site and keeps the water clear. In the early days of underwater archaeology, this type of excavation was thought to be impossible. A vertical wall slicing through layers of time each preserved deposit getting older the further down you go. The village was almost certainly destroyed by fire. This man found nearby, they now know is a mere 2,200 years old. With such a confusion of pilings, it was impossible to make a realistic plan of the village until the Swiss developed an accurate system of dating. Now, by taking samples from every pile, they can tell precisely the year and even the month the tree was cut, and so plot out the piles of the same age. The idea is to measure the width of each growth ring through a cross section of the pile. The width of the ring will vary according to the weather conditions during the growth period of the tree. With the help of computers, a graph can be quickly produced. By matching that graph to a whole series of graphs representing several centuries, the sample can be matched within a time scale. This sample belongs to a pile that was part of a house built in the summer of 2680 BC. I think uh, there will be still a great progress. There will be developed new methods, quicker methods, and the most uh, important thing, I think, today in Switzerland, in Germany too, in France too, the archaeologists themselves think that underwater archaeology is an important uh, part of the whole archaeology. Because when we started, we, 
were looked at as adventurers and not as real archaeologists. And now we have more and more people which are really archaeologists and learn to dive and not the other way around, divers who learn to be archaeologists. Away from Europe, across the Atlantic and the New World, is a prehistoric site four times older than those in Switzerland. A site stretching back more than 20,000 years. On the northwest coast of Florida is a 250 foot deep sinkhole called Warm Mineral Springs. People have come to bask in the sunshine and bathe in the hot mineralized water since the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors. Today they still come, mainly retired Middle Europeans, believing, as others have before them, in the rejuvenating power of the spring. But 250 feet below the surface lies the ancient remains of extinct animals and humans. In these deep, dark waters have been made some of the most sensational discoveries from the prehistoric world. This man, retired Air Force Colonel William Royal, was the first to find human remains. Today he is 80 and crippled by a diving accident while exploring at the bottom of the springs. Once Colonel Royal was at the center of a controversy that turned the archaeological world against him. It was in 1959 that an American TV company, attracted by William Royal's story, sent a Navy diver with a camera down into the springs to record the colonel's discoveries. We started working up the slope and I pick it up bones. Uh, we run into the uh, skull. And the skull was sitting right on bedrock. So we had, uh, you know, sediments were laid down in, uh, from 10,000 to 8,000 years ago. They wanted me to pick the skull up and hold it in my hand and bring it up to the surface, which shows that in the movie. But the most important thing is when I turned the skull over, there was hard packed leaves stuck on the base of the skull, and so I waved the leaves off underwater. And right in the foreman magnum hole, uh, where the spinal cords come through the bottom of the skull, I noticed this uh, looked just like white ivory soap. And so I started to stick my finger in and thought, gee, I said, this is real strange sediments. So, which this shows us in the movies, as I go up, I'm sticking my finger in, 
and wobbling on her own. I, then a thought occurred to me, this, this has got to be brain material. And oh my God, I was really, really disturbed because here, probably the first time in the history of the world anything this, like this had happened here, I destroyed over the half of the brains already. I was really uh, concerned, but there was about at least a third of the brains left. And when we got up to the surface, I told everybody, I said, it's fantastic. I said, we got a, a human brain in the skull. When the skull was cut open, one third of the brain remained intact. It was dated at around 11,000 years old. After the film was shown, no one believed it, and it was branded a hoax. I've always known that we had the most important uh, archaeological site in the world, and, and the first one in the world like it, uh, because I traveled around the world extensively. I'm, you know, I've been looking a lot. Anyhow, the, the most important thing is that uh, you could work down there for a hundred years with a team of archaeology wouldn't find it all. But we expect to go back. We've already gone back about 12,000 years in time. And uh, we should go back 15, 18,000 years as a possibility with humans. However, one man who did take notice was Florida State underwater archaeologist Dr. Wilburn Cockrell, known as Sonny. For years, he had been searching off the Florida coast for Paleo-Indian settlements. When he heard the stories of fantastic finds and early graves at warm mineral springs, it was too much for him to resist. But fearing his reputation might be destroyed, he arrived in 1972 with what he recalls as a good, healthy skepticism. I was rather skeptical about it when I first came here because for 10 years the archaeological profession had been discussing this as a as one of the most significant frauds in American archaeology. Uh, unfortunately, discoveries Colonel Royal made were so uh, earth-shaking that no one was uh, willing to believe him, and that's when the fraud story started. It's a very eerie dive, a first-time dive, or maybe even a second or third or 20-time dive. It's, it's a very, very strange place to dive. In the morning, it's clear, and in the afternoon, the water turns murky because it's photosensitive. We went down on the north side, and Colonel Royal took me to see the stalactites. And as, as a proof, the stalactites are wondrous proofs that this hole was once dry. I mean, stalactites take thousands of years to form, and the entire circumference of the cavity is ringed with dripstones, or stalactites, around 30 to 40 feet. Now, there are some as shallow as 12 feet, and there are some as low as 90 feet. Some of them are as, as large as trucks. And so I was able to swim through those and see for myself the actual proof that this place had indeed been dry for thousands of years. Of course, my question as an archaeologist was, was it dry when the people were here? I mean, if Colonel Royal had found human remains, were they there because they'd fallen in? Were they Indians that an alligator had perhaps caught on the surface and pulled under? Or just how did these bones, which Bill claimed to have found, come to be here? As you go in as a diver, this hole uh, slopes down and then drops off suddenly and becomes a giant hourglass. It drops down from about 12 feet and then it, there's a ledge. It opens up at about 43 feet and there are small caverns. And then it comes back together and its minimum diameter is half the surface diameter. And that's at about 65 feet down. And then it proceeds to open up again at about 100 feet. And from 100 feet, the walls slope outward from the middle, and it's as wide at the bottom, at 230 feet, as it is at the top. So we have a situation of, of an hourglass here. And at the bottom of the hourglass is a cone, just as we'd have in the center of an hourglass. 
that cone we hit in the center at 124 feet below the present day surface. It's the cone that holds the secrets of the springs. Whatever or whoever fell to the bottom will be there below the layers of accumulated debris, preserved by the bacteria-free water. But to excavate at this depth is both difficult and dangerous. Having satisfied himself that the site was legitimate, Sonny Cockrell gathered together a team of scientists, divers, archaeologists, and a video system to record and demonstrate the potential of what he felt was one of the most important archaeological sites in the world. Oh, we've got a beautiful picture. That's always been one of the criticisms of uh, underwater excavation, is that you could not excavate stratigraphically. As you can see, that's absolute bullshit. With limited funding, the work went on for five years until the state suddenly closed down its vast underwater program and the money ran out. In 1984, Sonny Cockrell needed help, and he got it. 166 Sarasota, I'll be 10, 8, about 10. Deputy Sheriff Skip Wood, having completed a master's degree in archaeology, volunteered his services and became part-time dive master and assistant archaeologist. Florida tag 241 Z Zebra J. John H. Henry. Cockrell persuaded the state to donate $100,000 to the project, and at last things began to move again. If you want mesh or you want cordor, the cordor is more expensive, just a couple dollars. Sonny's wife, Barbara. Yeah. Ex-model, diver, and chief assistant. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Barbara had worked alongside Sonny for two agonizing years to help get the diving restarted. Living and working in a small apartment a mile from the springs, the cockerel's life is now completely taken over by the project. The man hours that we've had to put in because of the limited staff are just incredible, and the amount of work that we've laid out to do this project properly is, is just too much that can be handled at any given amount of time. And so we, we're all pretty um, overworked, but we're all dedicated, and we're all just hanging in there with it. So with borrowed equipment, minimal tools for the job, and no on-site backup, the retired colonel, the deputy sheriff, the ex-model, and the archaeologist prepare to take on the task of excavating at the 45-foot ledge. They face the same problems as those of Nicholas Dixon in Scotland. An underwater site that cannot be seen, and information that will take time to be revealed. It's not the sort of project that attracts publicity-seeking sponsors in a commercial world. today. Animals and people could climb down the vertical walls and shelter under the stalactites on the various ledges just above the waterline. Today, those ledges are layered with remains. Giant ground sloth, camel, saber cat, and of course, human beings. Every find is marked and plotted. In every crevice, there are leaves, hickory nuts, pollen, and wood dating back 20,000 years into the Pleistocene age. Enough material to occupy the largest of laboratories and an army of scientists. has accounted for a total of 20 separate skeletons. 
One in particular interest was the earliest intentional human burial found in North America. With the remains was a very unusual find. Well, this is made of carved shell, carved from the central column of a whelk, a marine uh, gastropod. This was the hook for a spear thrower. It, when found, still had the original black pitch on the bottom. Uh, it was uh, glued to the end of the throwing stick and then lashed on. This was the far end. The stick was about this long. And we did not find the stick, unfortunately, with burial number one. But this is the earliest evidence of the use of a spear thrower in all of the Western Hemisphere. And it's found with the burial at 10,240 years ago. With this spear thrower, or the Aztec word for it is that ladle, uh, an Indian could stand here and kill at great distances with great force for the first time in, in the history of humanity. And we see just within two or 3,000 years following the introduction of this tool into this area, the Native American populations uh, grew in size and grew in stature. And I think this tool was one of the keys in that. If the people were here burying their dead, where were their settlements? With the help of the local adult educational college, Sonny now runs a field school, digging trenches into the grounds that surround the springs. We should add, we're getting a lot of this. It's in one area. It's in it's in the south part of the trench. Oh, OK, you are in. Oh, yes, yeah. it's really okay. tough. There's nothing are you ready? Left. Ready. Right. It was so tough at first, we thought we had uh, come into some iron filaments. That's, uh, so far, they've found only a few primitive tools, scrapers and flints. Of the village or campsite, there is, as yet, no sign. So what we're finding on land right now is negative information. We're finding that people were not here very much, and that continues to intrigue me. I mean, in, this, in this sense, negative evidence is very, very real evidence, and all this leads me to, to again, my conclusion that, that the utilization of warm mineral springs by these early people must have been primarily ceremonial. hard to imagine the springs as a ceremonial burial ground. But at night, when the hot water steams, it becomes home to alligators and insects drawn in by the sulfurous air. It becomes what it was, a primeval swamp. come down here many, many times, uh, daytime, night, ideally. Uh, we love to come here when there are people here, but, but most of all, we love to come here when it's just, just ours, just to us. And we get down and, and we can see fog coming off. I truly think we can feel what it was like when, when, when the people were here. Especially when it's a full moon. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll be down here particularly when I'm just walking alone and think, well, there were trees 150 feet tall here then, and <clears throat> I can walk down and just worry about mosquitoes. And back then, you'd have to walk through here and wonder about the saber cats. <laughs> Where were they? I mean, we'd be sad. We'd be very, very sad if, if we had to leave. I, I think it's urgent that we save this place. I would love to be able to do research as well. but. Primarily, I want to save it, and that's where our efforts are directed now. My primary goal in all this is to preserve this site. 
there is no law in this country to protect archaeological remains on private property. And this is private property. It is up for sale. If the new owners would want to back up a dump truck and fill it up with gravel, they could. Or if they wanted to have divers come in here and dive all they want for 25 cents an hour, they could. Okay, this place is only being protected by the goodwill and generosity of the owners, and that's all the protection it has. God. <laughs> Fun with your equipment. You get it feminine regular. <laughs> In the welcoming warm waters, it's hard to imagine many Sounds problems. Like dive, but there is a very great danger the divers must face. A risk when diving in the springs, a risk all divers dread. Equipment failure. Some of the gear we, we got back in 1972 and 73 when we first started coming in. For example, this is a new gauge. We just started working this week. Uh, this gauge was nickel-plated brass when I first uh, brought it in here, and I've been cleaning it up on a daily basis, but the uh, heavily mineralized water gets underneath the plating on any tiny little scratch and it lifts the plating off and goes down to brass and then the uh, the, the, the sulfates on the outside of the brass here turn it black and that doesn't hurt a gauge like this but our regulators i have a, a regulator here that that we've used since the mid 70s and you can see the brass uh, coming through the plating. The plating is virtually totally gone on this regulator. And of course, the internal workings are fouled. We would not dive with this regulator. Uh, the first stage is totally fouled on the inside from just having been used here for so long. Fillings uh, are damaged uh, by the corrosive water, silver fillings. We've had problems with that. When we were working down at seven atmospheres, and as we would come up, the air inside our fillings or inside the cavity where the filling had been would expand, and all three of us lost molars. We had molars actually split open underwater, and we had to have them replaced with crowns. So it, it, it's just an exceptionally corrosive kind of water. The, the biggest problem is, is the danger, it's just from something like this, from a piece of uh, corroded equipment. Cockrell's team continues to work knowing that each season could be their last. And they know, too, that the greatest surprises lie in the cone at the bottom of the springs. But at that depth, without the proper equipment, they literally risk their lives. Uh, 150 feet or over is an exceptional dive. It's a very dangerous dive. And uh, to begin with, they're just the physiological problems, aside from them staying alive, and aside from pressure, they're the problems of breathing compressed air, which contains 78% nitrogen. By the time we breathe that much nitrogen that deep, uh, there, there's a lot of impairment of, of reasoning and judgment and, and ability to think. But we've learned to, to deal with it. We've even done video down that deep to show that we can do it. We have <clears throat> done the deepest prehistoric work in the world. the vertical wall, they follow a line and a compass course down into the darkness. The mineralized water has a destructive effect on their equipment. In the past, demand valves have jammed and their air supply has been cut. The cone, with its deck chair, looms up like a mountaintop. They have only 20 minutes to excavate a small trench on the side of the hill. 
It's hard work breathing air at six times the normal pressure. And the sides of the trench are in danger of collapsing onto the diver. be at all surprised to find more human brain material and perhaps even find flesh. Uh, it would not be impossible to find human tissue in here or animal tissue. Uh, the, the possibilities of what you could do with DNA studies and that, of course, are endless. I think that this site is one of the most spectacular windows into the past that one could ever have. We can travel back in time here. We don't have to imagine what the world was like 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. When we get the analysis done here, we will know. There's no reason that we shouldn't have the same preservation here that you got in the Danish peat bogs. We have the same situation. We have an anaerobic peat. So what we have is in this one hole standing right here, a fossil history of the flora and fauna of the Pleistocene going back at least 20,000 years. Underwater archaeology has changed our view of prehistoric man. The work is remarkable, the finds astonishing. Our knowledge continually grows. It is certain that, in the near future, there will be discoveries to hit the world's headlines. The only uncertainty is whether there will be recognition and support for the work to continue. Next on Channel 2, At Home on Earth, followed by some good cooking, as Boston Globe food writer Cheryl Julian visits with two Brazilian chefs. The name of the show, Cook's Tour. It's brand new, and it's just a half hour from now, so stay tuned. Discoveries Underwater was made possible in part by a grant from the DuPont Company. DuPont, better things for better living. And by this and other public television stations. Mm -hmm.